know that angels have different MOs. They got different jobs. God has them doing different things throughout Scripture. We know that they're used as messengers. But we see that and all throughout Scripture. But one of my favorite places is when that angel comes and talks to the shepherds on the, on the day that Jesus Christ was born. He goes, I come and give you good news and glad tidings. So they're used as messengers. They're used to minister to God's people. I know we don't talk about this from time to time uh, because we're Westerners. But do you know that God uses his angels to to help us? Do you know that? We don't talk about that from time to time because sometimes you, you can go on this extreme uh, with, with angels and demons, but they're here to minister to us. They're here to help us. But we also know this, that they even helped Jesus uh, during his ministry. If you go back to the temptation story in the wilderness after Jesus stood strong against the devil, he was hungry, he was thirsty, but after the devil fled, his, fled from his presence, what does God's word say? His angels came and ministered to him. They have some awesome jobs in scripture. They're messengers, they're helpers, but folks, they're also agents of judgment. They will also assist Jesus in judging the world. These magnificent creatures that we read in Scripture that are so glorious will be used for some of the most difficult jobs in history. But these seven angels, they carry seven plagues. That word plague means wound, as in I've been wounded. Uh, so what does that mean? That God is sending these plagues, but God is going to wound the earth one final time with these plagues before Jesus Christ comes for his glorious return for his millennial reign that thousand year reign and he's going to send these these judgments these seven bold judgments we've we've already seen some judgments already but these seven bold judgments are going to come uh, they're they're described as coming like rapid fire one after the other boom 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 another thing to realize is that these bold judgments have been saved for the end of the seven year tribulation we don't get to the end of the seven-year tribulation and God says, and I'm going to add a year to that. No. The time is fixed. The seven years is seven years. These seven bold judgments are going to come like rapid fire. They're going to come so rapidly. I, I don't know the exact uh, the timeline. If it's going to come within a 24-hour period, if it's going to come within a seven-day week, or if it's going to come within a month, but they're going to be such horrible judgments and they're going to come so quickly that the world isn't going to be able to process them. And they're going to get worse and worse. These bold judgments aren't, aren't lightweight. As we've seen, the seven sealed judgments, they got worse and worse. The seven trumpet judgments, worse and worse. The seven bold judgments are the worst. And when does God use these? They're the last. He saves the worst for the last but I thought about that, that, that rapid fire uh, way they are going to come. I, I don't know how it's going to be, but since the date is so close, it made me think of those tragic events that happened on September 11th. I hope you took some time this week to remember that day. I, I hope that you never live life and, and just forget that day. The world was changed on September 11th, especially the United States. But the terroristic events on that day, uh, they were done by evil and twisted men. But they were done so rapidly. You ever thought about how rapid the events of September 11th took place? It, it wasn't drawn out, but it all happened on, on, on a Tuesday morning in 2001. Listen to these times. I'm finally at an age where I can process. No, September 11th took place when I was in high school. But I guess it takes 22 years for me to really think and, and ponder on these things even more as life goes on. And I still get chills and my blood still boils when I think about it. Listen to this. At 8.46 a.m. Tuesday, September 11, 2001, American Airlines Flight 11 crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. That took place at 8.46 a.m. At 9.03 a.m., not even 20 minutes later, uh, United Airlines Flight 175 crashed into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. Just when the world was glued to look at those towers, 17 minutes later, boom, another judgment, another t act of terror comes to the world. It doesn't stop there. At 9.37 a.m., American Airlines 77 crashed into the Pentagon. At 9.59 a.m., we thought seeing the buildings get hit was bad. 
But at 9.59, the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed. At 10.03 a.m., United Airlines Flight 93, through those brave people on that flight, where we hear those words, let's roll, crashed into a field in Pennsylvania. At 10.15 a.m., the Pentagon, what is known as the E-ring of the Pentagon, collapsed. At 10.20 a.m., the North Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed. I just shared with you seven things that happened so rapidly on that sad Tuesday morning called September 11th. Do the math. All those things took place under two hours of time. Rapid fire. Again, those are the things that took place by the hands of evil and twisted men that went after civilians, went after what we would call innocent people. And we know everybody's a sinner, but those folks going to work that day, they didn't deserve what, what came their way that day. Those are the things that took place by the hands of evil and twisted men. But the events that are going to take place in chapter 16, what chapter 15 is talking about, these seven bold judgments, they're not coming from the hands of, of an evil and twisted man. And they're not going after innocent people. These judgments aren't going to go after the innocent, but they are going to go after a sinful and wicked world that has rejected Christ. And I'll just share that with you just to... To describe that rapid fire, the way those judgments are going to take place. The world's not going to be able to process it. They're going to happen so fast. These seven bold judgments are the, are the last on earth. That's what God's word tells us. They're the last on earth, meaning before Jesus comes back. Before Jesus comes for his thousand year reign, which is also known as the, the millennial kingdom. We've already seen judgment in Revelation. We've seen the seven seal judgments. We've seen the seven trumpet judgments. But these seven bowl judgments, they come after that seventh trumpet judgment. These things come in order. Seven seal judgments, and I, I kind of refer to it as telescoping from one another. Seven seal judgments, seven trumpet judgments, seven bowl judgments. And these are called the last. They come last, and they're the worst. But God's word says this, for with them the wrath of God is finished. The wrath of God is finished on the temporal earth, the, the temporal judgments. We know there's an eternal judgment. We know there's an eternal wrath also, by the way. That's a place called hell. Uh, but this is the, talking about the wrath that is going to take place on this earth during the seven-year tribulation. Uh, this is the overall sign that John uh, sees. He, he's announcing it in verse 1. Listen, I saw this great and amazing sign in heaven, these seven angels and these seven plagues. We're not going to see those plagues unfold until chapter 16. But what on earth is taking place in chapter 15? Well, we see th two things taking place in chapter 15. And I, I want to divide it this way. We see heavenly praise and we see heavenly preparation. Heavenly praise and heavenly preparation. Let's begin with number one, heavenly praise from verses two and four. And when I say that we see heavenly praise, uh, we're looking up in heaven and we see some praise taking place in heaven. And what's crazy is that this praise is taking place in the midst of the greatest judgment that's about to take place on the earth. Let's look at verse 2. What John says, he says, And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. We've already seen a sea of glass in the book of Revelation. If you go back to chapter 4, verse 6, it says, John said, Before the throne, talking about the throne of God, there was at it, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. That's where we get that word, the crystal sea. Moses also described seeing something similar in Exodus 24, verse 10. Uh, then Moses and Aaron uh, and Nadab and Abihu, I can't believe these guys got to see this. You, you know how their story ended, right? God burned them up. But And the 70 elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the heaven for clearness. That sapphire stone is very similar to a sea of glass. So where is this platform that John is describing? I've already given it to you if you're taking notes. Uh, this platform is in heaven. It's in heaven. But we learn something else about this description of this sea of glass mingled with fire. So sea of glass, uh, talking about what we've already learned in Revelation, but mingled with fire, that kind of represents the judgment that's going to be seen later. But there's some people hanging out by this sea of glass. Who are these people? Who are the ones that are described 
and verse 2. Well, let's look at that together. And also, those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with hearts of God in their hands. This verse is describing those believers that would be called the tribulation saints. The tribulation saints. Uh, those folks that are going to be saved during the tribulation. That's not, please don't use that as your salvation plan. Okay? Don't say, right, I'm just going to wait. And, you know, we'll see how it goes. That's a horrible plan. Horrible plan. And Scripture also says this. If your heart's already hardened to Christ now, uh, it's probably going to be even harder during this time. But we see that there are going to be many, many people that get saved during the tribulation. And that is who is being described here. All those who are going to be saved during that seven-year tribulation. These are the ones that never bow down to the Antichrist. These are the ones that, that never take the mark of the beast. Uh, these are the ones that uh, they're not going to be able to buy or sell during the tribulation because they don't take the mark of the beast. These are the ones that are going to go hungry. These are the ones that are going to suffer. These are the ones that are going to go through persecution. These are the ones who are going to get their heads cut off. Those who get saved during the tribulation. Because if you don't identify yourself with the beast, the beast isn't going to tolerate anybody that identifies himself with the lamb. So these are the ones who, who have faced death. But dear friends, I want to tell you this. Even though that these tribulation saints are going to face death, they are conquerors. They are victors. How do I know that? Because they are standing in the presence of God Almighty in heaven. They are standing on the crystal sea. They are standing in the presence of God. It doesn't get any better than that. They took the advice of Jesus that said, don't fear the person that can, that can hurt your body. Fear the person that can hurt your soul. They, they took the words of Christ they never bow down. They never take the mark of the beast. They are victors in Jesus. What do we see in their hands? I think this is interesting. In their hands, they hold harps of God. Now, we've seen harps elsewhere in the book of Revelation, but these aren't like your modern-day harps. Uh, my administrative assistant, she used to work here, Cheryl Joring, she used to actually take harp lessons. I mean, that thing was massive, massive. I mean, it's on the ground. I mean, that's not the kind of harp that's being referred to here. But it's referring to another instrument that would be called lyre. Lyre. I know that sounds like the southern way of calling somebody out a liar. But I'm talking about a liar like a guitar, okay? Um, a stringed instrument. That's what they're holding in their hands. And I think it's so interesting that everybody that's standing by this sea of glass, these tribulation saints, maybe it's going to be all the saints one day. They're going to learn how to play an instrument. I've never been able to do that. I regret quitting piano. Um, took guitar lessons. It hurt my fingers. Um, but what's amazing is that these saints in heaven are going to be playing the instrument. You've got to think about this. I mean, they're going to be in perfection. Their minds are going to be clicking. Their fingers are going to be clicking. It's going to take somebody that knows how to play these things today. Or I don't know who plays them in heaven. Going, you just do this. You just do that. I got it. <laughs> You're going to catch on like that. You're going to catch on like that. But they're, they're playing harps. And whenever we see harps in Scripture, what are harps usually communicating? Joy and praise. Joy and praise. We even see that with, with King David when he was having those momentous times, dancing with the, with the ark, bringing it back to Jerusalem. And it says they were playing all sorts of instruments, playing the, the lyre. Okay? And they were joyful. They were, they were praising God but what are these tribulation saints so joyful for? Why are they giving praise to God? Is it easy? Because of their salvation. Because He has kept His promise. Because of Jesus' victory. It's His victory that we get to reap the benefits of. Because of His victory. Folks, we're not going to be in heaven by our own doing. They're not going to be in heaven by their own doing. They're going to be in heaven by the doing, the work of Jesus Christ. 
That's what they're full of praise for. That's what they're so joyful for. That's what we're supposed to come here on Sunday morning, Wednesday, whenever you're here. We are to worship and have praise because we have a God that saves. We have a God that loves. You should never get over being saved. If you get bored with your salvation, I, you might want to reassess things. Okay? Think about it. Think about it. Verse 3. They're playing harps. They're praising God. But what are they playing those harps and doing? Man, it, it gets even better in heaven. You're going to be able to do two things at once. Playing a harp and singing. I can't even clap hands and sing. If y'all look at me on this front pew on Monday mornings, our pastor just can't clap. He doesn't clap. I mean, isn't he supposed to be the worship leader? Folks, I'm sorry. I have no rhythm, okay? Um, I will get it one day in heaven, all right? Um, but uh, if y'all got a good clap going on, I'll copy you. But don't ask me to be your rhythm maker, okay? Verse 3, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying. So on their lips, they got two songs, Two songs. I, I, I just thought about this. These songs actually have a title. Uh, these songs actually uh, have a place of reference. But it's the song of Moses, the servant of God. I didn't write that down, but I was thinking about it on my way over here. That You know, in the Old Testament, when it refers to Moses, he's referred to not as the leader of Israel, not as this guy or this guy, but he's always referred to as the servant of God. Even in the book of Revelation, God still calls him a servant. Man, that's what we need to be aiming at being. That when you die, and your family asks me to do your funeral, you should want me to be able to say they were a servant of God. They were a servant of God. That was for free. But uh, in the song of the Lamb, saying, so we got the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. In the Old Testament, we see a couple songs related to Moses. Uh, in fact, we see two in particular, but uh, this song is most likely associated with the first song that we see uh, by Moses. And interestingly, this is the first song in Scripture. The very first song in Scripture is the, the song of Moses, and it's found in Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. And what was the occasion of that song? Uh, the occasion of that song was when Israel was delivered, when they crossed that sea, and they were delivered by the, from the hands of Egypt and the hands of Pharaoh. If you take a look at that passage, you'll learn that the song of Moses is a song of deliverance, a song of victory. Just as Israel was saved from the, the wrongdoing and the, the maltreatment of Egypt and its ruler, Pharaoh, these tribulation saints are going to be delivered from wrongdoing. They're going to be delivered from the ruler of the world at this time, who is the Antichrist. God has been a savior throughout all history. He, he's had the same job throughout all history. He has been a savior. So it's fitting that even in heaven, we're not just going to sing about the events that take place in our lifetime. We're going to sing about the events that have taken place throughout all of history. We're going to recollect all those times God has provided salvation and deliverance to his people. These tribulation saints will also be singing another song, the song of the Lamb. The song of the Lamb. While we may have already seen parts of this song in Revelation 5, we've, we've seen some songs in heaven already in Revelation 5. It, it appears that our passage is giving us more lyrics to this song that we're going to sing that's related to the song of the Lamb. So I, I just say this, if you want to know the words, go ahead and start practicing them. Okay? If you want to know these words, you don't have to be like, what are they saying? I think we're going to learn songs really quick, like we learn how to play the harp. But uh, here we have the lyrics. We, we have one of the hymnals of heaven right here. And what does it say? It says, great and amazing are your deeds. O Lord God, the Almighty, just and true are your ways. O King of the nations, or O King of the ages, other translations say. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. You take a look at those, those verses right there. What is the main focus? What is the main idea? What is the center of this song? Is it the works of man? 
Are they singing about themselves? Uh, do, are, are they singing anything about me, myself, or I? No, they are singing all about God Almighty. What's the song in the Lamb about? The Lamb. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. He is great. He is amazing. He is almighty, all-powerful. He is just. He is true. He is the King of the world and the King of the ages. He alone is holy. And He will be worshipped. I like what the, the writer, the commentator John Phillips uh, wrote about these two songs. He made some good observations comparing and contrasting the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Listen to this. The song of Moses was sung at the Red Sea. The song of the Lamb is sung at the Crystal Sea. The song of Moses was a triumph over Egypt. The song of the Lamb is a triumph over Babylon and the world. The song of Moses told how God brought His people out. The song of the Lamb tells us how God brings His people in. The song of Moses is the first song in Scripture. You know what's interesting about the song of the Lamb? It's the last song in Scripture. The song of Moses commemorated the execution of the foe, the expectation of the saints, and the exaltation of the Lord. The song of the Lamb does those very three things as well. I also like what Chuck, Chuck Swindoll has to say about these saints playing harps and singing songs by the Crystal Sea. This is interesting. Unlike teaching and preaching, musical ministry will endure throughout eternity. Singing and praising will never cease because the more that finite beings like us get to know our infinite God, the more reason we'll have to praise Him. That's why that verse in Amazing Grace is one of our favorites. How's it go? When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. We're never going to get tired of it. We're never going to get tired of it because we're never going to stop adoring and loving our Lord. We're going to be so amazed every single day of eternity. My mind can't go that far. That's what, I, I know yours can't either. That's why, you're not, that's why I don't hear anybody saying amen and jumping up and down, doing jumping jacks and doing flips in the pew and all that good stuff. But it's going to be great. Verses 2 through 4 give us a glimpse of heavenly praise. But what does the rest of this passage show us? It's our second point, heavenly preparation. Heavenly preparation. And what do I mean by heavenly preparation? In these verses, we see these seven angels preparing for what is about to take place. We see them taking the position. We see them getting ready to pour those bowls of wrath on the earth. Let's look at verses 5 and 6. After this, I looked, and the sanctuary, the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure, bright linen, with golden sashes around their chest. As we've learned already in the book of Revelation, we see a lot of things in heaven that, that had counterparts on earth. Or we should say the things on earth had counterparts in heaven. Things such as a temple, things such as an altar, uh, things such as incense. Those things that we say that God instituted on earth, we see them uh, being seen in heaven, we see them being in heaven. And uh, what do we know about this? In the Old Testament, we see, well, first off, we see these angels coming out of the sanctuary of the temple. We see them coming out of there. In the Old Testament, who were the people that had access to the, the different parts of the temple? The priests. They had all sorts of barriers to keep certain people from different parts because of God's holiness. Uh, we know the Holy of Holies was reserved for the high priest. And I know I've heard this over time. They had to tie a rope to his legs in case he dropped dead to pull him out. But we also know this. The sanctuary in heaven is going to be different than the sanctuary, the temple on earth. The reason there are so many restrictions for the temple that we see in the Old Testament. Why were there so many restrictions? Because of this thing called sin. This thing called sin. Folks. That's not going to be a problem in heaven. There's no curtains. We as believers are going to have uninterrupted access to God Almighty. We are, it says He will be with His people. We are going to be with 
him. We see the seven angels uh, coming out of the sanctuary with the seven plagues. What does this mean? That This means that these plagues coming to the earth, if they're coming out of the sanctuary, which represents the, 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 the presence of God, even though we know the presence of God is all over heaven, and he's, he's omnipresent, but it's manifested in a special way to know that these angels are coming out of God's presence with these seven plagues. What does that tell us about these plagues? What does that tell us when these rapid fire judgments come into the world? Do they come from the devil? Do they come from the sky? Do they come from under the earth? Do they come from a demon? No, where do they come from? They come from God. They come from God. If we look at the plagues in Egypt, who did they come from? They came from the hand of God. The plagues in Revelation are also going to come from the hands of God. Of God, they come from His presence in heaven. The angels' uh, clothing, their attire, uh, communicates something about who they are. It communicates their holiness and purity. Folks, this means that this judgment is holy. God's judgment is holy, and I know an unbelieving world has a hard time with that. But judgment from a perfect God comes from perfect holiness. No one can ever accuse God of being unjust. Or unholy. That's why I know I've, I've, I've had some of you. I'm not tooting my own horn here, but I, I don't go and listen to a bunch of different churches. I clearly don't have time. But I, I've heard some of you say, "I just don't hear anybody preaching on this stuff, Pastor. I, I don't hear other churches doing this." I know one of the reasons is this: people don't want to talk about judgment. People don't want to talk about wrath. People are uncomfortable with it. And sadly, there's preachers that are uncomfortable preaching it. If that's the case, you need to quit preaching. That's not the job for you. But here we see that this judgment comes from God. Hell and judgment are realities because our God is holy and he's just. A holy God, I want you to hear this. A holy God cannot let sin go unnoticed and cannot let sin go unpunished. Think about this. As believers, as believers, we are forgiven. We are justified. We, we, we stand legally innocent before God because of Jesus. He gives us that, that perfect righteousness with that great exchange. On the cross, He took all our sin. And in exchange, He gives us His perfect righteousness. And maybe you like singing it like this. He has made me white as snow. Uh, he, but our forgiveness, listen to this. It does not come without a price. It does not come without a price. Common sense, church. Just like anything else the government tries to say is free. It ain't free, okay? All right? Our forgiveness is not free. Our salvation is not free. And let me tell you this. It wasn't cheap either. It wasn't cheap. Our salvation was made because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, took God's wrath against sin On the cross. Yes, he was nailed to a cross. He had nails going through his hands. Nails to his feet. He was crucified. He was scourged. He took that that severe physical beating. But there was another element that took place on the crucifixion. When Jesus said, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? You know what he was saying there? He He was experiencing God's wrath against sin. Our minds can't compute that. There's a dimension that took place on the cross that that we don't even, we can't even comprehend. Jesus took the wrath of God on the cross. I want you to think of this. Think of this. Let's take Jesus out of the picture. Let's take Jesus out of the picture. And let's say that God forgave everyone for their sins. I'm just going to forgive everybody. I'm a good God. I know y'all are some horrible, horrible people, some horrible, horrible sinners. I forgive you. No penalty has to be paid. No sacrifice is needed. I forgive you. Now, in some circles on this earth, people are like, oh, Lord, we love you. We love That's exactly what they want to hear because they don't understand Scripture. They don't understand that you can't just have forgiveness. Folks, if our God said, I just forgive you, Without a price being paid, let me tell you something. He would no longer be a holy God. He would no longer be a just God. Because a God that is perfect in holiness 
has a perfect reaction towards sin. A God that is perfect in justice has to pay a price. And we saw all throughout the Old Testament with the sacrificial system, those things would never, ever pay the price. Only Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, could pay that price. And He did. He did. All those things, God's holiness, God's justice, God's love, can be seen on the cross. That's why I love having that cross pulpit, because I can just use it all the time for stuff. But verse 7, And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Uh, that word for bowl, I don't know what you're envisioning. Maybe you envision a big old cauldron, a big, a big old deep bowl that you're going to use for chili. I'm, I'm going to get a pot full, Pastor. No, but that word for bowl here uh, represents a, a, a shallow saucer. Uh, think of just a, a, a thin little frying pan. That's what this, this, in other words, call it vials. Vials. But it, and what, does that, what does that mean? That these angels aren't going to come with these bowls and they're not going to be like tipping it over and just pouring it out slowly. Because what did I tell you about these judgments? They're going to come quick. They're going to come quick. So I want you to think about, think of that frying pan with that grease. It's going to come out quick. If you ever put that in a trash can, you probably shouldn't do that. I've learned my lesson, okay? All right? But it's going to come quick. This, this, again, communicates that these judgments will be released rapidly. Another argument for this is because I've already shared this with you. The tr this takes place at the end of the tribulation. At the end of the seven-year tribulation, God is not going to stretch it out further than that. So they're going to have to take place one after the other. It could happen in one day, folks. The events we read about for 9-11 happened two hours. I think our God is much more capable of doing things a whole lot quicker. They will happen rapid fire. Verse 8. The sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. No one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Seeing the sanctuary filled with smoke takes us back to the Old Testament. We've seen that take place a couple times in Scripture. Uh, one is uh, when, when, first to tell you this, smoke is frequently a symbol of the presence and glory of the Lord. Uh, we see this taking place in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 through 11. When Solomon dedicated the temple, God's presence was manifested as a, as a great cloud that filled the building. Another occurrence takes place, this is one of my favorite passages of scripture, so I'm going to read the whole thing. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Some of y'all know this one. Um, verses 1, beginning in verse 1. Isaiah says this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of His robe filled the temple. Above Him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two He covered His face, and with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew and one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of Him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. Isaiah, the prophet, he's getting a glimpse of this. He hasn't been resurrected, by the way. He's still a sinful man getting to see this. And what does he say? Woe is me. For I'm lost. For I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah witnessed the glory and holiness of God. He, he witnessed that, that, that temple fill with smoke. And guess what it immediately made him realize? For Isaiah, it made him realize this. His own sinfulness. His own sinfulness. Dear church, the same glory that Isaiah sees in this vision is the same glory that is going to pour out these judgments in the book of Revelation. And it's God's holiness that will pour wrath on the earth for its sinfulness and wickedness. And this wrath is not going to come without warning. This wrath is not going to come without God Sending forth messengers and warnings time after time again. 
especially during this seven-year period of tribulation. Think about this. By the time this takes place, the church has been raptured. The church is raptured before the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. What is the world going to do when all these people just disappear? There's going to be a lot of false stuff going out, okay? There's going to be a lot of false theories, but there's going to be some truth-tellers. There, you know what's sad? There's going to be people that go to church their whole life. They're going to get left behind because they were never the real deal. People that have heard preaching, they've heard teaching, they've heard truth, but they never surrendered. They never took it seriously. There's going to be those kind of people that are left behind. They're going to be like, I'm going to tell you where they are. God took them. They've been raptured. There's going to be a lot of gospel conversations from the rapture. Okay? I'm glad I get to be a part of it. Um, but the rapture's taking place so far with all the different judgments that have taken place on the world. Folks, if, if, you're on the world, if you're in the world during this seven-year period and you can't come to the conclusion, there's something wrong here. What's up with all these earthquakes? What's up with all these disasters? Of course, there's going to be a false narrative for that as well. There'll be gospel conversations to come from all those judgments. Folks, we've seen all sorts of demonic judgment. All these crazy creatures that are let out of the pit. They're going to come and wreak havoc on the earth. But people still aren't going to believe in the Lamb. We've seen a great eagle flying in the sky, talking. People still aren't going to believe. We're going to have the 144,000 Jewish evangelists who are going to be the best preachers who've ever lived who are going to be untouched, sealed by the living God and Christ. They're not going to be able to be taken out by the, the Antichrist. Their preaching is going to be on fire. And folks, people are going to listen. People are going to believe. A lot of people are going to be saved through their ministry. There's still going to be a lot of people that don't believe. Now we have the 144,000, you have these two witnesses. And we've talked about those. It, it could either be Elijah and Moses or, or Elijah and Enoch. We don't know. But, but these two witnesses are going to be powerful preachers. I mean, CNN, whoever the news agencies then, they're going to have these guys on the screens watching their ministry, watching them preach. They're going to be high-profile people. But we're also going to see that they're going to be murdered. And the cameras are going to be on those bodies. Full-time. Spotlight. Helicopters. All those things. Here we have the two so-called two witnesses over here. You're going to have all that taking place. They're going to come back to life. And they're going to be raised to heaven. They're going to be taken up to heaven just like Elijah was taken in a cloud. You're going to have all that. People still aren't going to believe. You're going to have these message, messengers, these angelic messengers that we talked about in Revelation chapter 14. This angel in the sky who proclaims the, the glorious eternal gospel. What is that? It's the same gospel we talk about today. It's the same gospel you go to your small town church, it's the same gospel the preacher is preaching to the people in the pew. It's going to be preaching it for all to hear. You're going to hear all these other messages. People still aren't going to believe. Their hearts are going to be hardened. They're going to reject Christ. Folks, I want you to process that unbelief I'm talking about right now. Then I want you to brace yourself for the judgments we're going to get into next week. These people... These lost people that reject Christ, they're going to be without excuse. They're not going to have an excuse because God has given them so many opportunities of grace to turn to Jesus Christ for salvation. So I share this with you tonight. You don't have to face God's wrath. You don't have to face tribulation. You don't have to face this thing called hell. I've already shared it with you. We have someone, his name is Jesus. He went on the cross to take God's wrath. He went on the cross to take your place so you wouldn't have to take God's wrath. Amen. I need to fill you in just a little bit more. He didn't just do that and just say, okay, you're saved. But he did that. And God's word says we're supposed to believe him. We're supposed to trust in him. 
for our salvation. We're supposed to ask Him to be our Lord and Savior. So if you have not come to that point in your life, if you haven't done that, I don't care how many times you've heard the truth, I want to ask you this question. Have you responded to the truth? Have you responded to it? Jesus Christ took the cup on the cross and even on the night of His even on the night before he was crucified, folks, he knew exactly what he was getting into. He knew exactly what lay ahead. He knew exactly about the horrors of the cross. He knew exactly what his mission was. He knew exactly what the wrath of God was because he is God. Amen. And he said, Father, if there's any way for this cup to pass. But you know what he said? God was silent. He was saying, no, this is my perfect will. Because my perfect will is to save sinners. And you're the only way to save them. I love how Jesus ended that prayer. Not my will. But your will be done. Folks, I pray you please. Take advantage of Jesus. Amen. Don't miss out on Jesus. Don't miss out on heaven. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you tonight. And we just thank you for your word. Father, I pray. Lord, if there's anyone here tonight that's lost. Lord, if there's anyone here tonight that doesn't know your son Jesus, Father, I pray they will just ask you to come into their life, to be their Lord and Savior. Lord, they'll, they'll come to you and to confess that they are a sinner. God, they'll confess their sins to you. I know, I know there's way too many. There are more than a number on our head. But God, they'll just come to you and admit that they are a sinner. And God, and I thank you so much for your word. It says you are faithful to forgive. Father, if that is the story for anyone tonight, I pray that their story will change. And Father, for everybody in this, this, auto, this sanctuary whose story has already changed, Father, I pray that we will be filled with joy, we will be filled with praise, and God, just put a burden on our hearts for all the lost people in our lives to share that good news with. Be with us as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.